Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. This is Politics Today live on China's television. I'm Sean sure Kimaloye here in Abuja. Still, we're still in the euphoria of the Easter celebration. Happy Easter to all our Christian brothers and sisters, wherever you may be watching tonight. Let's get started into what has become some kind of good news as Nigeria, uh, Nigerian army has announced that there is some kind of a, a decimation of the terrorists in some parts of the country, especially in Katsina and Zamfara states. The army had come out today to say uh, its troop deployed for counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations in Katsina and Zamfara state have raided terrorist enclaves, resulting in the elimination of some terrorists. In a statement uh, which the military released on uh, social media earlier today, the army says that in an operation in Zamfara on the 29th of March, troops raided the den of a notorious terrorist kingpin, Hassan Yantawa, in the South local government area. His group have allegedly been responsible for kidnappings and acts of terrorism in some parts of northwest Nigeria. And it's good news that they are being invaded and captured. The, during the operation, troops overpowered the terrorists and ensuing gun battle neutralizing three of them and covering a large cache of, of your arms and ammunition. Troops have also destroyed the terrorist camps. Tonight, our attention will be on what is causing the uh, power grid collapses in the country. The IEA said that this has happened for six times in six years. And that those who say it has happened even more times under the Buhari, eight years in power, than we have seen in these six years. So what is the way forward? It's a major headache to manufacturing, to production in Nigeria. When we cannot achieve as a country stable power supply, how can we then function in terms of production uh, in the manufacturing and the production sector? We're looking at a solution for Nigeria. What are the alternatives? How do we go forward? What is Mr. Adelabu doing as the Minister of Power? Is he a sense, a sense of frustration? Uh, how, how do you describe what has become a menace uh, in Nigeria's um, the mainstream of our economy? Power, electricity is at the center of it all. We get a sense of that tonight. Stick around with me, everyone. Let's first serve you with some of your political roundup stories. The All Progressives Congress APC in Oyo State says the party will contest and win in the forthcoming local government elections in the state scheduled for this month. At the end of a meeting with all the candidates of the party across the 33 local government areas, one of the leaders of the party and Minister of Power, Mr. Adebayo Adelabu, notes that with or without beavers, the party will contest and win. The minister urged members of the party to work for the success of all its candidates in the local government elections. The northwest zone of the All Progressives Congress has asked members of the opposition party in Zamfara State, accusing the Minister of State for Defense, Mr. Bello Matawale, of giving palliatives to bandits to come forward with the evidence of face legal action. At a press conference in Kaduna State, APC Northwest Zulu Publicity Secretary Musa Mada says the party welcomes positive criticism from the opposition, but such criticisms should not violate the provisions of freedom of speech. Mr. Mada accused the People's Democratic Party's led government in Zamfara State of the persistent slandering of the person of the immediate past governor, Mr. Matawale, who is now the Minister of State for Defense. The Lamidia Papa Group of the Labour Party has berated President of the Nigerian Labour Congress, Mr. Joe Ajero, over what it described as illegal appointment of Sol's AGO4 as Board of Trustee Chairman. At a news conference in Abiyokuta, the Open State Capital, the publicity secretary of the group, Mr. Abayomi Arabambi, says the mission was targeted to fuel political insurrection that will assassinate the current democratic dispensation and disorganize the structure of the party. 
stakeholders of the People's Democratic Party in Cross River State are calling on youths across the board to engage themselves in meaningful activities rather than depending on political appointments. The state chairman of the PDP in the state, Mr. Benashius Ikem, who led some officers of the state executive committee of the party, including the senator representing the northern senatorial district of Cross River, Jared B. Agom, to welcome defectors from other political parties in the Goja local government area of the state, assured the new entrance of equal opportunities in the party and urged them to be productive. There is what they call the up Nepal generation. And those who have, uh, if you have been born in the last 45 years or more, you might fall within that bracket. Those of you who have never experienced in a normal Nigerian situation, I'm not talking about those who live in some communities who are relying on uh, off-grid power supply. I'm talking of those who live in a normal, medium, uh, lower-class society in Nigeria. If you're born in the last 45 years or so, you probably be part of the Up Nepa generation. What is the Up Nepa generation? Well, Nepa is the acronym for the uh, state-owned power uh, company, which eventually when it was privatized and broken down and their discos and jenkos and all what have you, let me not bore you. So those who were born in the last 45 years, you may not have been experienced or ever experienced a situation where you have slept for one week without interruption of power. I did I say one week? I mean, one day, 24 hours, and not experience interruption of power supply. And maybe you've traveled to Egypt, Ghana, South Africa. You would have seen how relatively stable their power uh, consumption is in that country. So you ask yourself, what is the problem with Nigeria that we cannot even have two days of uninterrupted power supply. If you are in Abia State, in some part of Abia recently, they've started enjoying un uninterrupted power supply. I say congratulations to you. What about the rest of Nigeria, where this consistent power interruption has gone on? So the transmission company of Nigeria has come out to say, it has successfully restored the national power grid following the collapse uh, on Thursday. And these, we understand, is one of the 46 times that the power grid has collapsed um, from 2017 to 2023. Uh, the International Energy Agency's uh, report has uh, uh, told us that that's what has happened. And in fact, under the President Muhammadu Buhari, eight years, power grid collapsed 98 times. Between 2017 and 2023, 46 times. 2022 alone, eight times. 2020, uh, 2022, eight times. 2023, three times. That is the menace that we have experienced as a people. So when we say power grid collapse, the national power grid, that is, it is a situation where the entire country is shut down. There is total darkness in the whole country. That is what we are talking about. It's happened 46 times in six years. 98 times altogether, both partial and full grid collapses under the eight years of President Muhammad Buhari. In 2023, three times. But I'll be going deeper into all of what Nigeria has in terms of electricity assets. I'm not talking about the private sector, but as a nation. A lot has happened in the past few years as to the laws regulating power distribution, generation, and transmission. But tonight, I'm not going to be boring you with all of the jargons. What we need to take head on is the problems and what are the solutions. Here we have a former deputy governor of the central bank who is head in the Ministry of Power, Mr. Adelabu. Does he have a solution? I mean, it's going to be a major headache for the Tunubu government, isn't it? If you cannot sustain regular power supply, manufacturing will suffer. We cannot produ produce successfully without regular and consistent power supply. And we're looking at alternatives. Tonight, I'm being joined by a power or electricity or energy expert, Mr. Idowu Oyebanjo. He joins us live here in our Abuja. So thank you so much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank you, Sean, for yeah. having me. And uh, welcome to all our viewers. Yeah. It's nice to be here. Thank you so much indeed, Idowu. Uh, let's get to it. And uh, I don't know, you, you may not belong to the power, <laughs> the up generation. 
But those of us who have not really experienced uh, the goodness of uninterrupted power supply, uh, we thought that the worst was over when those things were broken down uh, after the Nepa era passed. But what would you say, first and foremost, let's tackle these power grid collapses. Would it be majorly of vandalism or what? What causes these power grid collapses? So power grid uh, collapse uh, occurs for so many reasons. And these are very complex issues, including vandalism that you have talked about. It's very important to state because if a power tower, an electricity tower is uh, vandalized, so the electric, uh, electric uh, overhead lines come down and then power is disrupted. So that's one major cause of uh, grid collapse, uh, vandalism. That is also the problem of generation and also the problem of networks. So what do I mean? Essentially, a power grid will collapse if there is an imbalance between generation and consumption. So whenever you have a mismatch between what is generated and what is being consumed, then you have a grid, you have a problem with the frequency. And once the frequency wobbles below certain uh, uh, settings, then the grid will collapse because it's no longer stable. So many things can cause that. For example, if the loads are rejected, so if you have a situation of load rejection from the distribution system, then you have that. If you have a lack of supply, for example, if you have shortage of gas, like the one that happened just a few days ago. And which, by the way, is about how many percent? Almost 70% of our... Oh, yes. So it's quite up to 80% of our portfolio mm. is gas. So gas is a major issue. So, and how can we have shortage when we have gas in abundance? Yeah, production of gas is capitally, uh, is capitally intensive. You need a lot of infrastructural investment in the area of, uh, of gas for you to be able to get gas off the ground and then power them to uh, send them to the power stations, gas power stations. But you also have the problem of finance, liquidity, because if gas producers that we have uh, do not get paid back for what they have sent to the generating companies, the GENCOs, they will not continue to fund that because they will be in debt. And the generator, generation companies, the GENCOs, we also say, oh, hang on a minute, I have sent enough power to, through the transmission network and I'm not being paid back. So there's this liquidity issue that is finance is not coming back. So people are not getting paid. As a result, they shut down. We also have the problem of equipment damage. So in the case of what happened recently, after the shortage of gas, the grid wobbled, then there was a loss of one of the generating plants at Ergin this time. So the loss of a generator generator can also cause uh, a problem for the remaining uh, system. And some of these technology are outdated also. Oh, yeah. But uh, the use of technology, we, we have to do what the Renew Hope Agenda has just uh, uh, made possible right from the time of President Muhammadu Buhari, the Electricity Act that was signed. This is about the only way for Nigeria to get about out of this conundrum. And which way is that? Is to fully implement the Electricity Act 2023 as amended, to decentralize the Nigerian power system. The Nigerian power grid is not massive, but for 60 years, as you have mentioned in your introduction, we have not been able to get it right. So we need to split this system and take it back to the states. States have now been empowered to generate transmit, if necessary, distribute electricity to their citizens. This should be the most important focus of discussion in the Nigerian power sector, apart from all the other investments in the areas of metering and infrastructural development that the administration is looking at. Let's take a look at some of the facts. Maybe we can just gradually give a sense of what all of this means for Nigerians and to Nigerians. 
So we look at it. We have 24 gas power plants. That's what we know. Is that right? Okay. And in all of these, uh, a combined capacity of about 11,000 megawatts. Those are some of uh, uh, the facts and figures. Maybe uh, you can give us an insight into what all of this means. Uh, uh, that 11,000 megawatts uh, delivers just about 30% of its capacity. And we'd like to know why. Uh, the total installed capacity is about 13 G, uh, uh, gigawatts. An average available capacity is 4.5. 5 gigawatt as of 2023. Give us a sense. And in comparison to countries like Egypt, countries like South Africa, our installed capacity is less than what we, can, what we need, actually. How can we gradually move forward? Okay, thank you very much for that. You are right with the figures, and uh, it's uh, as a result of uh, systemic failure in the, in the last many years. So... If you recall, before privatization, we were just overing about the same figure of about 3,500, 4,000. Before privatization, 2013. And then privatization was done, and technical and financial competencies were not taken on board. This is very critical for any power system to work. So let's get the first straight. If you want power in any country, you must do what they are doing in all those countries that have uninterrupted power supply. And what is this? One, meritocracy. Two, professionalism. Three, competence. Merit, merit, merit. So, so mediocrity has usually been the order of the day in, in, in contracting, in development, in installation, and in infrastructure. Is that the case? Sure. So, and when you have a system that does not celebrate merit, you will never get electricity right. So, how do you get to a point where you have 13,000 uh, uh, of uh, your megawatt? That's 13 gigawatt. That's gigawatt, yeah. But there is a mismatch of the capacity of the transmission. Now, there is also a mismatch. Your transmission, your record there shows that transmission can take about... 7,000, 5,000 we have on record, mm -hmm. and distribution can take 3,000. So this gap, how did it happen? Some people will say, oh, we have less generation. It's true we have less, lower generation compared to what we can consume. But when you have 13,000 and you are not able to consume it, generation cannot continue to ramp up. Mm. You need to bring up that transmission system to be able to come up towards 11,000 megawatts. Then the distribution to also come up to come, to come and uh, consume this electricity. That's number one. Now, why do we have a mismatch? It's because there has not been enough investment, okay, in the in the in the sector. So, so let's get let, let, let's get let's get it right, so that our people who are watching tonight might, might be able to get a full understanding. So, uh, these are two Apple products, right? So this looks like what we are generating. It's yeah. about 13,000. Yes. And this is what we have capacity. This is what will bring light into Nigeria. Yeah. That is the transmission, yeah. isn't it? So that's the, the mismatch we're talking about. Yes. So we have some power in some place, but unfortunately, we cannot deliver it. Yeah. And that's a curse, isn't it? It is. So it's like you have a jug of water yeah. in abundance, and you have just like a cup of coffee, that is a channel to funnel the light. Yes. Is that, am I right? In yes, my, you are in, right. In my basic? Absolutely. It's basic and it's clear. That's it. So what do you do? It's like a liver, a cantilever, where you have the fulcrum and then you have the uh, ruler or a, a piece of wood across it. So you have the 13,000 this way and the small part 3,500 this way. So you have to start bringing them up, don't you? Yeah. So that's investment. Let me, let me allow my producer to bring me a jug of water and a cup of tea. Uh, if my producer can bring it on set. Because I'd like you to give Nigerians a sense of what the problem is. And perhaps, this is a major idea. If you were the president, I'm not sure if you can do just anything in this country without a proper power generation. So Absolutely the kind of good news, yet. Mr. Uh, 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 is what we saw, for example, uh, in Abia State. Uh, 
uh, the Bath in Naji uh, backed and the idea state government, and it's just about six or seven local government areas. Yeah. And there are those who will say there are other sources or alternatives to generation and distribution of power, uh, the biomass, solar, and all other view. Could this also be the possibility of solution to our problems? Absolutely. This will be the way to go. Every state of Nigeria, or most states of Nigeria, have resources, biomass, waste to power. We generate significant amount of waste in this country. So any state should be able to aggregate this waste rather than just burn them for nothing. They can use them to generate electricity. Also, you mentioned what has happened in uh, Aba. That's a very classic example of what needs to be done everywhere possible in Nigeria. So independent power projects like that, where the private sector is being given the environment to be able to generate electricity, transmit, distribute it, and even give it back to the consumers, metered consumers. This will revolutionize the Nigerian power sector. And that's why I said that the decentralization of the Nigerian power sector, which has been signed into law, since June 2023, needs to be fully implemented. Without this full implementation, and now when you are implementing it, you must implement it with the right kind of resources. Meritocracy must be the foremost for any state. You cannot afford to do a system that will take us back to what we experienced from 2013 to date. Experienced professionals, be it in legal aspects, accounting, commercial, but most importantly, technical. The power system is a hugely technical system, and governance structure for it must be technical. The support services are the accounting, the commercial. Look, without technical competence, you cannot have a proper power system. So, you, so um, which part of this would you say is perhaps the biggest? So, uh, if the cameraman can... Uh, it's not this simple, though. You can bring a rule or something to slant across this. Okay. That's exactly. It's to yeah. slant across now, this. Now, so th th let's assume that this generation. is the generation. That's the transmission. And we have... Uh, yeah, so this is probably the generation. And we know that this cup cannot contain it, but this is likely to contain it. So if I pour this into this, and I still have this, yeah. Yeah. this is our major problem. It is. We have a limited capacity to transmit. Yeah. And we are, uh, we are probably generating maybe four times more than our capacity. Sure. So this is what we need to increase now. Yeah. Even the generation is even less than what we need. Absolutely. In South Africa and Egypt, what are their generation look, looking like? Well, you have thousands, 50,000 uh, megawatts for, uh, uh, for the population that is far less compared to us. But you see, in reality, you... We cannot be making such comparison, actually. Mm. It's, uh, because what drives generation capacity is the demand. So the fact that South Africa, with a far less population than Nigeria, generates 50,000 megawatts and maybe distribute them, will not be sufficient reason to say Nigeria should also do the same if we don't have the demand. So the industries have left, most industries have lived in Nigeria, because of energy costs. Manufacturing sector shutting down because uh, you have uh, problems of uh, high energy costs and they can't stay competitive if they have to manufacture in Nigeria. But what you need to do is to, like I said, implement the Electricity Act. So take an example, Abia State has done what Geometric Power Plant has done in Aba. Mm. So they've taken a franchise area where they will provide electricity. So they generate what is needed, and then they distribute it to those areas, and then they start to enjoy electricity. Many companies have now started relocating to Aba as a result. Now, if you do that everywhere in Nigeria, in, in Kaduna, in Kano, in Potakot, in Lagos, Lagos, in Ogun State, that's what you are going to have. Private sector should be enabled by the state government to build capacity. But there, there is a law that says that uh, a pr private interest can generate up to one megabyte. I mean, one megawatt. That is what is, am I right? 
So this has been amended already in the Electricity Act. So the Electricity Act has made it possible to decentralize the power sector, to make sure that we can use renewable systems, so solar, mini-grid system, biomass that you mentioned before now, landfill gas, uh, uh, waste to power. So what is needed now is for state governments to have a, a, an enabling environment that will allow private investments such as the one we have seen in ABBA to flourish and make sure that estimated billing is outlawed, make sure that what we call protection, so there is something called protection, okay, coordination. The lack of protection coordination in Nigeria power sector is a major disaster for this country. And that's what is causing uh, mm. most of the grid collapse. So, I mean, uh, not to oversimplify things, uh, but for the sake of those of us who are not in your sector. So, Nigeria needs maybe three times of what we are generating now to be able to meet up. Yeah. And that's going to be about 13,000 times three. So, you're talking about 40,000, 50,000. Yeah. So, that, that, that is what we need. So, about three times or, yeah. or four times of what. Yeah. So, then, uh, state government, uh, we don't have much a pro problem with distribution, do we? So, the distribution is the last mile. And they are the ones that actually take the electricity to, to, the, consumers. to the consumers. But when distribution is having problems with their infrastructure, there's not been investment in the distribution. So they are still outdated. They are still old. And so this is why the state government needs to come in. This is why the law says, look, over to you, state governor. Mr. State Governor, can you please implement the Electricity Act? So which part of, in these three segments, generation, distribution, and transmission, still are exclusive to the, to the federal government? Which one? It's only the transmission it's system. It's only transmission. Now. That's still with the way. So uh, generation and distribution can still be taken on by private sector, by the state. And the state can take ownership of those. Yeah. So it then means that in all of these, we need more generation and we need a lot of clusters of transmission. And That's it. Yeah, you are right. A lot of investment in transmission and distribution. And my recommendation is that because Nigeria is currently in the 1920s mm. of the UK and US power system. That's how outdated our, our system. Oh, yeah, that's how far back we are. we are. What we have to do is to do exactly what they did back then, which is why I said the electricity has to be fully implemented. Go back to the states. Let the states take charge of the power supply of its citizens. Do regional grid. So, for example, in the southeast, you have the southeast regional grid. You have generation in one part of this, in all the states, and they serve the people, and the excesses are also uh, distributed among themselves. Mm -hmm. And if they have to push power to southwest, they can do so through this current transmission network. The same thing, we have power, significant hydro generation in the north. We have solar. We have wind power generation. You can, you've heard of a lot of wind, wind the farms. The sun in Kano, Meduguri, Katina, Kebi can, can fry anything without you light, lighting it. Look, you are right. Nigeria is supposed... And that is supposed to be a strong point for us. We have abundant gas. We have abundant uh, uh, sunlight. And these are natural sources of uh, power. Okay. And yet we are not able to transmit, uh, transpose that into, into to productivity. Exactly. So look at the United Kingdom. Now that they are struggling with their power system a bit because of... They have gone to North Africa to get a massive portion of the desert to install solar cells just because they need the sun. And they pipe that through on the sea cable all the way from North Africa to United Kingdom. So Africa, and indeed Nigeria, that should be pioneering renewable systems, mm. use of solar, wind, and other re renewable resources, we've not done that. And that's because of lack of meritocracy. The right people don't get the chance to get to the right places. And for them to be able to implement the right things. You're, you're talking have. about North Africa and the UK. In this country, in this Nigeria, in the Northeast, there is a private interest that, has, that is generating some form of power and taking it to neighboring African countries. Private interest. 
yes. using natural sunlight, solar, and transmitting it. So, Mr. Uh, you know, just for us to wrap up. So, this is what we need: some level of generation stability, isn't it? Yeah. And we need an appreciable transmission capacity that can accommodate it. Not oversimplifying, but it does look like this is what we need, isn't it? Yeah. But since you have 13,000 megawatts now, and you are only taking 3,000 megawatts, mm. so there is a gap of about 10,000 wasting away. What we should now do is take those 10,000 megawatts yeah. and give it to the manufacturing industries in the, na in the nation. All you need to do Get the addresses of all the manufacturing industries. Put them cluster by cluster. Take power to those people. Use mobile substations from Siemens or that we have used recently. Connect these industrial locations. Because when you power these locations, yeah. they pay a premium, mm -hmm. and you use that even to subsidize your other customers, residential customers. Suddenly, you have this we'll gap with we'll this appeal. And we will not be experiencing this kind of... Uh, uh, it's an embarrassment. How can a whole nation be thrown into darkness when we have abundance? God has blessed us with all of those resources, but yet here we are. We throw our hands in the air as though we are helpless. But we are not. We, we need to do something. And I hope that your insight tonight will be able to help. Thank you so much, Mr. Ido Wu. Thank you very much. Your, your time tonight. I appreciate it. We'll take a break, everyone. But when we come back, our attention will be on different other issues, uh, security, um, uh, cost of governance, and a way forward for this country. Kratu Sobhan, who is, ne is next to join us on the program, everyone. Join us again, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, stay with us. Mr. Kratu Sobhan is a former lawmaker and uh, chieftain of the All Progressives Congress APC. He's live with us here in Abu Jassiru. Thanks so much indeed for your time tonight. Thanks for having me once again after a protracted <laughs> absence from channels. <laughs> You've been on vacation, yes. election and all what have you. Everything. Uh, let's look at what has happened over the last few months of President uh, uh, Bola Tunubu. It's been some very rough road. And uh, tonight we're looking at how he can navigate those rough parties. Relationships with the National Assembly, relationship with Nigeria... In another month or so, the president will be one year in office. He spent about 11 months already. Um, what would you, I mean, one of the areas that a lot of people had debated or raised the question mark is perhaps the role of the National Assembly in helping or working or being, uh, doing their duties as uh, uh, prescribed by the Constitution to the Nigerian people. But in your own assessment, how has that been? But let me say that the, the Tinubu presidency came in at the most turbulent time of our political history. In any case, we've never had a smooth history in the last 64 years, or nearly 64 years. But by October, we'll be about 64 years as a nation, as a country, as an independent country. Each successive government have always been touted to be the worst compared to its predecessor. No government has come into office and Nigerians will tell you that this is the best government. It is always, in comparison, the worst compared to the last one. Buhari was the worst because of Jonathan. Today, Jonathan, I mean, Tinubu president, Tinubu is worse than Buhari. When Tinubu leaves office, it will be better than the next person because the expectations are high. As a nation in growth, in motion, a nation in motion, what the expectations are, are constantly on, undermined by factors that Nigerians have not gone through. And each time Nigerians talk, especially those abroad, in the UK, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, 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 in America, they keep telling you we are not, we copied from America, we are not doing what America. But you forget that America, after 200, nearly 250 years of practicing democracy, still had to deal with the issues of Trump in Capitol. They have to deal with the electoral issues of uh, Florida and all that. What that means is that we should be learning. But under a Tinubu presidency, I can tell you, working with the National Assembly, I have made this point over and over, that it's the first time in our history that we are having the president as a former parliamentarian senator, 
the vice president, former senator, and the senate president, a former governor and minister, and all of them former governors. The first three citizens of Nigeria today have held both executive and parliamentary positions. Should that be an advantage or a disadvantage? A great advantage to which you are seeing the less rumpus that you had under the last administration, if you remember. The last two Senate presidents were a problem to this country. The Saraki president, Senate presidency, if you remember, it was a clear Palestinian versus Israel war in Nigeria. But those who would disagree with you that, in fact, we had healthy uh, competition uh, between the executive and the parliament. And, in fact, there are those who have opined that in the four years of um, uh, the, the National Assembly in the last four years of Buhari, that that was a, a parliament that gave uh, an approval, just a, a straight jacket approval to everything the executive had. Unlike uh, the, the, the Saraki and the Dogara uh, uh, administration, which did a lot of check and balances. And in the last four years of Wari, we saw a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, anomalies especially with the CBN. And these were the issues that I raised about the approvals the National Assembly made, which is now coming to light as a misnomer. Let me now make this point to Nigerians this night. And I have always maintained that there are distinguishing factors between partisan politics and nation building. The parliament is not an alternative or an, a, 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 an opponent of the executive. That is not the intentment of a parliament. Now, when you talk about the last four years, that is the Lawan Senate presidency and that of Saraki, and you are talking about a robust engagement. There are two different things. You will agree with me that each time you undermine the parliament, the fulcrum and pivot upon which democracy dep depends. In 1983, we tried it, and it was Nigerians calling in the media for a change of government. When it did come, Nobody was spared because it is what you will call a zero-sum game where everybody will lose. Now, under this present administration, what you are calling, Nigerians call it a rubber stamp parliament in which everything is just passed. Look at Buhari's requirement for the Tukano. The Tukano will take you four years and they insist that you must pay now, otherwise you won't get them at a particular time. And he went ahead to do it and explained to parliament. Parliament under this agreed. Under another regime, under another circumstance, the parliament will oppose it and Nigerians will be paying the price for it. You can see clearly that he's subdued to a very large extent what you knew today as, what you knew then as Boko Haram. Today we are dealing with bandits and kidnappers. Unlike the Boko Haram that was constantly taking our ungoverned spaces and putting flags there. Today you can't say that in Nigeria because that, those actions were taken. Are you able to justify how the parliament in the four, last four years of President Buhari approved ways and means, which is even some of the lawmakers who were there at the time are regretting their actions. Now, I tell you this. When you take one isolated incident and position it as if it is the universal norm, you will be unfair to the, government. The ways and means, means that almost crippled this government. country. I'm telling you that the ways and means is one isolated case. But you almost crippled this country. Yes, agreed. One action can cripple a country, can throw a country into war. One action of one man, one act of indiscretion. Is it justifiable under such a parliament? Ways a and means, I insist, was one of the errors of that, er that period. It's one of the errors. We cannot use it and judge the entire era of So history. do you blame those who like in the Aquabio um, and, uh, and uh, Abbas uh, and mini, uh, uh, leadership in the National Assembly who liken it to a rubber stamp that they experienced in the Lawan Bajabi Amila era? Now, this is the error of the moment. The Akwabio you are talking about has been governor and minister and now Senate president. There is nothing you are going to ask him to do which he knows will not stand. Remember, on over two or three times, there were reversals in decisions within the first six months. We are just running 11 months, you are counting. You are counting 11 months out of four years. Out of four years. And those 11 months, you have seen a lot of reversals. NDDC was reversed. Appointments in NDC that were approved by the National Assembly were reversed. The National Assembly didn't, didn't just accept it. They were ministerial, ministerial nominees. They were rejected under an Akpabio Senate presidency. 
Remember also that under this Senior presidency, this president has had to withdraw even budgets and ask for supplementary budgets and some additions and some other things which today you are calling padding, which is something is, that is laughable for anybody who understands how a parliament operates when we talk about budget padding. It's like saying that a medical doctor whose, whose duty it is, to, especially a gynecologist, to treat a woman, a husband brings her and then the woman finishes treating and the husband now takes the doctor to court for unlawful knowledge of his wife when he took him there for doing his job, or a hangman who goes to perform a duty that the judge approves and will now say this. It is the duty of National Assembly to add, subtract, modify every budget, and we call that padding. And then when that happens, you are, like I said, you are saying that the hangman who goes to perform his duty has already committed murder, and you take him to court or start castigating him. This is what you are doing to the National Assembly when you say that they padded the budget. And you don't want to, you are ignoring the fact that there is on the, on the current of those who are asking for the removal of uh, these, I mean, uh, of Apadio within the national, within the Senate. It is the tragedy of our democracy that ignorance and ignorant people have constantly made this country a laughing stock about how democracy operates. To ask for Apadio's removal is to deal with the symptoms of a crisis than to deal with the causative agencies. For instance, you are dealing with a parasite. You get into the cold, you have parasites of, uh, that mosquito implanted in you, and you say it's because of the rain that beats you. That's why you have malaria. Rain does not cause malaria. It's a plasmodium of the mosquito that causes malaria. It is never rain. So when you talk about Apabio, you are just dealing with symptoms of what has happened because Apabio does not in any way prepare a budget. He and his colleagues, cannot even a senior president approving the budget of his own constituency. You saw some of the alleged infractions, how they amass different kind of things in the budget to themselves. You've seen those allegations here and there, haven't they you? Are, they remain allegations born out of sheer ignorance. That is crass ignorance, proudly and arrogantly displayed in the public domain. Let me ask you, for instance, does the senator, does any senator have a right to even propose a budget? He cannot. All he does is the ministry brings a budget and say, I am from Ikorepene, you now bring, I'm a Bukima, for instance, and the minister of lands or minister for works says the road to my village should be constructed and puts 10 million as at May last year or as at June last year. By this year, we discovered that bitumen and other things will go. The price of cement has gone from 3,005 to 11,000 to 7,000. And you bring it to the National Assembly, and we are now considering in January 2024 what you proposed in June 2023. And by this year, cement has gone to 7,000 from 3,005. Will you allow, as a senator, as a House of Rights member, as a House of Assembly member, will you allow the price of that road that one kilometer should still remain 15,000, for example, when the price of cement has now gone, and you know that drainages will take over 100 bags of cement, that whose price has doubled? And you now say that if you now say, Increase it, this budget to fifteen thousand. You say it is padding it. That is a sheer. No, we're talking about. about uh, I mean, how did we even get here? <laughs> That's not the. No, we are talking about, about the Apabio. Uh, I'm talking about. No, the I mean, I, I'm wondering. Apabio was never going to be the subject of conversation, but no. Yeah, but let me let me take you to uh, uh, a, a, a more serious. Uh, I mean, uh, conversation that we're supposed to have. Uh, there seems to be. Uh, litany of, and I'm happy with some of the successes that our military and our security agencies have seen. Uh, for example, uh, uh, those who killed some police officers, um, and our heart goes out to their families, the IG has said that they will go after them. We understand that some of them have been arrested. You saw what happened in Okwama, for example. Those military officers uh, were killed. And what is Surrounding all of this is the issue of illegal oil bunkering. Those who are living in those communities have said, you are from that region. How can the president navigate this kind of rough patch? First, it requires a lot of firm but fair treatment of those, our military men, who have sworn on oath to, take their, to sacrifice their lives for us. What happened to Kwama and to those policemen should never be tolerated. When people talk about human rights, you forget that the soldiers and the policemen also are first Nigerians before they became policemen or army uh, or soldiers. And when you take their life and then go on national television and go on internet and spread the videos of them being gruesomely murdered and decapitated, and then you turn around and talk about human rights for the communities, the president has a duty, and which he rightly took off, and which is why this president must be commended when he insisted 
that any harm done to a soldier is a declaration of war because they are to defend the national territory. And if national assets of the country and the life wire of this country, which is oil, is being tampered with, soldiers go there even for peace. If they went for war, nobody would have been there. They wouldn't have gone to that town hall, the soldiers in Okwama. They would have gone there to take Kona North and come out, on, uh, come out without arms. But for that community to do, and we all come from communities, the president has to insist on the community leaders, the Niger Delta leaders, and I've made this point since the era of, uh, of uh, Yaradua, that we in the Niger Delta owe ourselves a duty. They gave us our 13% derivation, gave us NDDC from Mompadek, and we turn around and become the chief culprit in undermining and compromising whatever was going to be our comfort. Today, they have given us yet another chance, and people are pilfering oil, and when you're about to be stopped, they go into gangster, gangsterism, and then some people come out and say they are lawyers, they are community leaders. We are also from Niger Delta. The boy who was killed, that Daniel Obi, is from my village. I paid for his farm to go to NDA. He's the only member of his family still existing. His father died, a farmer. The other brother died in an accident last year. And you gruesomely murder him. They are lucky they are not our neighbors. We'll just send two people to sit in that community and see whether it will exist. The army is just joking. I'm telling you this, that nobody will come to our community. Last year, between Agbo and Asaba, policemen were on guard doing the normal routine check. The robbers just came down and gunned them down. One of them is my nephew. Was my nephew just last year. And this year, again, Daniel Obi has been gone down. And then you now talk about that, and we are all from Niger Delta. They are not supposed to know this, because anybody in uniform anywhere in the world is protected by citizens. In fact, in places like America, if you go there even as a Nigerian soldier and show you your ID card, you buy less. Why should we Nigerians, even our media, even our social media bandits, as Shoinka will call them, will come back and start displaying pictures of dead Nigerian soldiers in the war front? Why do you do that to us? Have you, do you have more satellites than CNN? Have you seen the dead body of an American soldier? You don't ever see it. You only see him on a casket with an American flag. But in Nigeria, we display how we murder is a female soldier and a husband going for a traditional wedding and display it on social media. Are we fair to our country? Are we fair to our military men? Are we human? Have we lost our humanity? Is it in our place to do that? And Daniel called me a week before that day that he was murdered. You tell me that he's coming to see me to thank me for what we are doing for the community. You got to control a road to my place with personal funds, and he came to me. And then you turn around and tell me that that's human rights. And people like Feng Falano, a senior lawyer, talks as if he's not a Nigerian, as if not an African. Our basic humanity that has been sold to the world, you come back and tell us that those soldiers should just walk away. Do you know what it takes to train one Nigerian soldier, even a recruit? And you are talking about a left-hand corner, you are talking about a major, and people sit back here and be talking about human rights. Whose right? Do the soldiers have animal rights? Are they not Nigerians? and they went there to help the country. So the president has to be firm on this and take on those committees and their leaders so that anybody who is talking about it is an accomplice. First, he should first yeah. be accused before you even talk about trying him. So I feel very bad, I'm very touched. This is a wrong left you have just touched this night because that case of Major Daniel Lobby is particularly touchy right. to us as a community. We don't have up to three military officers because to even get recruitment is a problem. I don't know what we spent to put him in NDA. All right. Honorable Kletu Saban, as the chieftain of the APC, thank you so much indeed for talking to us tonight. I appreciate it. And as it goes out, and we continue to remember the families and those who have lost their lives in the battle to uphold the territorial integrity of this nation. That's how we end the program tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'm Shiwa Kimale. God bless Nigeria. <laughs>